My name is Bonnie Burstow, and I'm honored to be here today. Day. And there's only one way I can start, because this is a very special day. This is a day of the anniversary of the Montreal Massacre in, uh, in 1989, where Mark Lapine, in a horrible tragedy, shot 28 women at a call polytechnic and killed 14, saying he was fighting feminism. Uh, in, the, uh, in honor of our fallen sisters, can we have a few seconds of silence, please? Okay, thank you everyone. If we could put a marker here, what happened at uh, uh, A Call Polytechnic is a, and it was a huge, is part of a huge range of killing people in schools, and in this case it was motivated by misogyny, and in other cases it was motivated by other issues. In all cases, people have said of all of these massacres, and you know them, they were hordes of them, especially in the States that if only these people were put on a therapeutic dose of psychiatric drugs, this wouldn't have happened. I want you to put a marker here, because I'm going to be coming back to this question later on in the talk. The topic today is, is about psychiatry. It's a library book talk, which essentially reflects, in abbreviated form, reproduces what, what, uh, what happened, what, what, is, uh, what has developed in, uh, in my a uh, book that came out a year ago, approximately a year ago, Psychiatry and the Business of Madness. I'll now again dip into that book and read sections from it, but I will read from here because it's bigger writing, <laughs> and I didn't bring the book with me. Uh, the book is based on research with hundreds of interviews of survivors, with family, with psychiatrists, with psychologists, with nurses, with social workers, with hundreds of analyses of documents and with direct observation. For instance, I attended 15 meetings of the Consent and Capacity Board of, uh, uh, of Ontario, the Mental Health Consent and Capacity Board. Beyond that, I've spent decades and decades studying this institution. Uh, you know, uh, in addition, the book has a complicated combination of methodologies. It combines historical analysis with medical analysis, with critical discourse analysis, with a powerful methodology which you will see more of in the book I've just had released uh, called Institutional Ethnography. The position of this book, and my position, is that there is something inherently wrong with psychiatry. <coughs> with every aspect of psychiatry, that it's fundamental conceptualizations, that it's power, that it's modus, with its modus operandi, something so wrong that we cannot continue with it. So you might say that was a radical position. Now I realize the query that I'm inviting people to, uh, to take here to, uh, is maybe frightening for many. And obviously this is not a beginning position, this is an end position. The book begins, and I want to begin today, by looking at the enormous power of psychiatry. And indeed, psychiatrists have humongous power. They are the only people who can take away freedom from people on the basis of having committed no crime whatsoever. The only officials in the state that can do this for any prolonged period. The only professional... Can somebody get me water? And it needs to be hot. Oh, you remember. They're the only professionals who have king-like power and why I say king-like power is the king has a special, special kind of power, kings in bygone eras, not current kings, in that their words are performatory. If a king from the 16th century or the 17th century or the 18th century says, you are exiled, there's no point asking whether or not you're exiled. The words perform what they, what they pronounce. And similarly with psychiatrists, if they say you are committed to, because you are dangerous to self or others, you are committed because you are dangerous to self or others. So if you look at it, we have a, a profession with power, it's okay, with power that no other profession has had and no other group of people has had for hundreds and hundreds of years, and yet they have it here today. So if, uh, now along with psychiatry is a huge lot of other people, because there's a larger institution of which psychiatry is a part, the state, the police force, 
the schools of learning and be assured that schools are centrally involved in people ending up in the psychiatric system, in delivering people to the psychiatric system. Uh, other legions of people, nurses, psychologists, social workers, lawyers, everyday families included members and have been so manipulated by the system that they have been turned into the eyes and ears of psychiatrists and of psychiatry and do their job for them, of monitoring their loved ones, all with good intentions, but because they have been sucked into the system, so they also are victims here. Finally, and I cannot uh, list all the groups, but I can't stop without listing this one. At the center of it all right now are the multinational pharmaceuticals which provide not only the substances that most control people, but fund and frame much of what is happening and whose economic interest this lies more than in any other single group. Not to say that there's a huge economic interest in psychi by psychiatry itself. Now with such, a enormous, uh, such an enormous uh, play of power and invasion of freedom and blatant self-interest of a mass of massive proportion is involved here, and this would be problematic no matter what. This degree of power and this degree of invasion would be problematic no matter what. It is all the more problematic, however, if it has no substance in the first place. That is, if the psychiatry's basic tenets are mistaken and foundationless, and that is precisely my claim. That said, I want to quote from the book. It starts by saying, this is a study of, a, of psychiatry. It is a study of an area officially a branch of medicine and overwhelmingly seen as legitimate, benign, progressive, and effective. That psychiatry is typically so viewed is readily apparent and may seem a no-brainer. Doctors specialize in it. It is covered by our health insurance, overseen by ministries of health. Doctors special, okay, uh, a high percentage of the population uses its, quote, treatments, unquote, People encourage their loved ones to consult a psychiatrist when encountering, quote, quote, personal problems, unquote. And the media routinely record, report its, quote, discoveries, unquote, and, quote, improvements, unquote, much as they would report, quote, breakthroughs, unquote, in the treatment of cancer. But what if society had it wrong? What if this were not legitimate medicine? What if psychiatry's fundamental tenets and conceptualizations were inherently faulty? What if, indeed, what if, despite some good practitioners, it does far more harm than good? Now, this is not an easy thing I realize I'm asking people to entertain, for such is the hegemony of psychiatry. So much as it permeated our existence, we cannot easily question mental illness. We are told by a government but that one out of every uh, three people experience mental illness. Uh, we keep hearing from surveys the percentage of people who have particular, quote, mental illnesses, unquote. We're told again and again it is a disease like any other disease. All of this frames how we as the average person see it. So we see mental illness everywhere. We dock down the street and we hear people muttering to themselves and think mental illness. We, even when we hear distressed people uh, people who are just normally distressed, and note it's normal in life again and again to become distressed, that's part of existence, we think maybe they should see a shrink. Uh, now, sometimes the people are very distressed, and then we're really sure the person's mentally ill. And I want to begin with an example of a person who I, uh, who, who, an interview, whose interview with I had with, I quote again and again in this book, and for the time being, I will call the person Amy, because uh, some people may know her, and I would, she's, she, she's not anonymous, she's not, she's not even vaguely anonymous in the book, but, but for, for, for this audience, I want to call her Amy. Amy uh, was institutionalized in jurisdiction after jurisdiction throughout uh, North America, and everywhere, she, for three decades at least, and everywhere she went, sooner or later, someone would lock her up. Why? because at some point in, the mo in a moment of crisis, she would shed off her clothes and go knocking on people's doors naked in the middle of the night saying emergency, emergency, including later on when she was now middle-aged. And although she had no history of any violence, whatever, what would happen at this point is people would phone the police, 
The police would pick her up and restrain her. They'd take her to the hospital. They would he heavily drug her, and they would leave her on drugs for months and months and months on end, and years on end. And did things get better whether the drugs got less as time went on? No, over the decades, the drugs got more and heavier and heavier uses of drugs, and she was on them longer and longer. Now, I interviewed some very enlightened people and people who had a critique, and initially, even the people who agree that that the, you know, who agreed that there's a problem with psychiatry felt that the people who called the police did the right thing. Um, now I want to ask you why. What need is there to lock up people who act differently just because we don't understand them? But, uh, but uh, I'll touch on this later, but just in the meantime, just want to touch on this, uh, on, why, on why she said emergency, emergency. People, when I asked people, but why do you think the police need to be called? They would answer she was of danger to others. Well, let me ask you two questions, and I asked uh, a few questions, and I asked the people who I interviewed this. How dangerous do you think a naked middle-aged woman is knocking on the door in the middle of the night? Just how dangerous? Especially one who has no record of violence whatsoever. Whatsoever. How likely is she to hurt others? Significantly, when I asked these very questions to other interviewees, they suddenly looked confused. It never occurred to them that the obvious thing wasn't to call the police, that, that, that she wasn't dangerous. The point is, if something's outside of our comfort zone, we automatically bring in the twin concepts of mentally ill and dangerous, and together with the need to call the police. I want to return to this example later, because I think it's a very important example. So. I want to uh, briefly touch on dangerousness to others, because that's what comes up here. People are locked up all the time in, in jails called psychiatric institutions uh, on the claim of dangerousness to others. This is a hallmark, as well as dangerous to self, but I'm, I'm just focusing on this right now. This is a hallmark of psychiatry. Let me say a few words about dangerousness. We, we use it in connection with, uh, with uh, mental illness so much that we think there's a connection between the two. What, in fact, does the best research show? The best research shows the, quote, mentally ill are no more dangerous than anyone else, in fact, slightly less so, in which case we should lock up the rest of the population, not them. <laughs> okay. And the second thing it shows, because don't forget they're locked up on the say-so of the king, that is the a psychiatrist. Psychiatry has no ability to predict future dangerousness, none. I want to quote here from nothing less than the American Psychiatric Institution. Please note, I'm not quoting from anti-psychiatry. I'm quoting from the American Psychiatric Institution, institution uh, who, in their, their, to their, in, from their amicus brief to the Supreme Court. So if they don't say they have an ability, you have to believe it, because they claim all sorts of things that we can't believe. But, but they say claim don't have an ability, you, you, you pretty well have to believe it. Here's their statement about their ability to predict dangerousness. Quote, the unreliability of psychiatric predictions of dangerousness is now an established fact. Even under the best of conditions, it is wrong in at least two out of every three cases. Listen to that, two out of every three cases. We would do better with a roll of the dice. That's how random we're talking about. And that's on the basis of which they have the king's power to exile somebody into a psychiatric institution. So the, 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 the ability of psychiatry to lock people up rests on two state powers. And these powers go back a long ways. They predate psychiatry by some time, OK? Uh, the, 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 the powers are one what's called parents patriae. This is Latin. Don't worry. It, it means father of the country. If you're wondering, this sounds like a patriarchal concept. Of course it is. So it means taking care of them for their own good because I'm the male and I know better on some level, right? And the other, the other power is called protection of the peace. So first one, parents patriae, we're locking them up for their own good. Second, protection of the peace, we're locking them up for the good of everyone else because they're dangerous to others. So dangerous to self, dangerous to others. Again, I'm going to ask you how dangerous to anybody is somebody, a middle-aged woman with no history of violence, who uh, predictably so that people know about it, takes off her clothes and pounds on the door in the middle of the night. An inconvenience, maybe, but hardly dangerous. Some of the questions I'd ask you'd like to ask you to ponder. 
what are doctors doing protecting the peace? I thought that was the, the police's job in the military. Does that sound like a medical uh, position for you? And especially when they can't predict dangerousness anyway. Again, wrong two out of every three times. Are we allowing these state powers to get confused? Are we really worried for our own safety for no good reason and saying we are protecting people for their own good? My guess is yes, and certainly from what I've seen, yes. And how is it that depriving of people of their rights uh, uh, is, uh, or, uh, is a benefit for their own good? Very unclear how depriving people of rights is a benefit for their own good. So this is the parents' patria I am looking at, that clause that we are protecting them. How is it protecting them to take away their powers and make them totally vulnerable? So the, here I want to uh, quote from a uh, Christian theologian. Uh, I'm not Christian, but he's a very bright theologian. Okay, C.S. Lewis. And he wrote, of all tyrannies, a tyranny exercised for the, for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. The robber's baron's cupidity Cupidity may sometimes sleep. His cupidity may at times be satiated. But those who torment us for their own good, for our own good, do so without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. Their very kindness stings with intolerable insult. To be cured against one's will and to be cured of states that we may not regard as disease is to be, is to be put on the level with those who have never reached the age of reason and those who never will, unquote. So what is involved here, let me suggest, is not so much dangerousness or help as control, and never so much as when psychiatry alleges it's doing something for people's own good. So the upshot, what do we have here, is the psychiatric power is more than a little questionable. It is a massive violation of human rights. It is a problem even if mental health concepts had validity. It makes matters worse, they don't have validity which brings us back to where we began, the concept of mental illness. What is mental illness? As I stated in the beginning, most people see it all around us. Uh, would surely say, what did I call the woman at the beginning who's, uh, who's uh, let's, I'm gonna call her Agnes now if I change so. Amy. Amy, thank you. Uh, you see, I can't remember my own pseudonyms. I must be mentally ill. Uh, the, the, uh, would surely say it about Amy is mentally ill. Is she? Well, to be clear, I am not suggesting that there are not people who at various times in their life have severe problems in living. May, they may even be in urgent need of help and want help. That's different than saying they have a mental illness. First, let me call your attention to this very bizarre use of language. And we use it so much we don't notice it's bizarre, but it is bizarre. Uh, what's odd about it? A combination of the word mental, which is a psychological term, with the term illness, which is a bodily word. Exactly how do these go together? Illness is a quality of the body. Only bodies can be ill. Mind is not a physical entity. And so, can, and so can't be ill. What is mind? Mind is a, is, is a verb that's been turned into a noun. It's in fact activity of the body, the activity of thinking. Can no more be ill than any other activities of the body like running. So something very strange has happened here. And if you want to know if someone has a real illness, if the person has an illness and die, then their corpse has the illness after they're dead. When schizophrenic, someone called schizophrenic dies, what do you think happens to the schizophrenia? It magically disappears. Not an illness. Now you may think there must be illnesses, for there are symptoms of mental illnesses. And indeed, there's this huge book called the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, also called the DSM, with hundreds of mental diseases, each one with symptoms spelled out. Take one, paranoid schizophrenia. What is the symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia? Well, there's about 14 or 15, but among the most well-known are paranoia and delusions of grandeur. What's wrong here? Well, let's go back to the issue of the corpse that I just gave you. Let's say someone is, quote, schizophrenic, unquote, and has delusions of grandeur. Now let's say they die. Does the corpse have delusions of grandeur? <laughs> Anyone ever seen a corpse with delusions of grandeur? <laughs> so it seems to fail the, the, the test uh, for a medical disease. 
What relates to this, it is a misnomer to call these symptoms of diseases. The point is, real symptoms of real diseases are bodily like illness itself. What are they? Swelling, rupture, edema. You can see them in, a, you can see them in an x-ray. You can see them through a microscope. A delusions of grandeur is not like this. Now, to, clear, to be clear, people may have ways of thinking or behaving uh, that are, uh, or, or, or even beings that are things that are imputed to them that others are not happy with. The person themselves may be incredibly unhappy with and want them changed. That does not in itself make them medical. So what is the status of this strange concept of mental illness? Let me suggest, and I did not invent this answer. Uh, it was invented a long time ago by a man called Thomas Saz. It is, it is a metaphor, uh, but hardly an innocent one. Because the purpose of this misuse of, of language is to make something appear medical, which is not in fact medical. Now, now you might say, but it looks innocent enough. We use metaphors all the time, and we do. We talk about sick, a sick joke. We talk about a sick economy. The difference is we do not call in a doctor to cure the sick joke or the sick economy. So we're doing something very different here. This is a development that happened historically, and money and profit motive is integral to what happened here. Once upon a time, there were many different people involved in the madness turf. If you go back you know, to the 15th century and the 14th century, uh, with the powers divided between different types of healers, quote unquote, uh, it was a profitable turf, and eventually doctors went for a monopoly on it. Uh, the and who were the other groups? They were uh, the women healers, they were the astrologers, uh, uh, they were doctors, they were businessmen, they were, uh, and, and, and doctors, you can see, were just one of the groups. And doctors went after control of this area, viciously went after control. They actually had other people fined if they tried to treat people. Uh, and at one, now, now they, they eventually they gained absolute dominance and then it looked like they were gonna lose it. They were, it looked like they were gonna lose it with the rise of the humanistic therapies. Uh, even the rise of psychoanalysis, never mind the humanistic therapies. And a doctor started losing out. Why? Because they weren't very good at it. <laughs> they weren't good therapists, quite simply. Uh, so now they started putting increased stress on what only doctors could do. And now we started to see the biologizing of all of this, the claim to pushing toward medical, and, and a big part of it came was the pharmacological revolution, an unholy alliance between the drug companies and medicine. Uh, so what I'm suggesting here, again, well, there's no question there are individual psychiatrists uh, who might be trying to do good, and maybe some do. What ultimately happening here is the subjugation of people to psychiatrists' interests and the industry's interests at the expense of their own with the aid of bogus medical concepts. Also the consolidation of what is essentially a regime of ruling or what Michel Foucault calls a truth regime. To turn to it now, how does the regime of ruling work? By alignment with the state. And let's not, let's be very clear, none of this would be possible without the state. Uh, there are special powers embedded in law which the state yields to psychiatry. Also the creation of special texts which are so, so geared as to facilitate psychiatric rule. Example of such texts are the mental health acts which exist around the world. Another biggie is the DSM, again the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorder. The DSM is particularly important for it lays out so-called disorders as if they are fact. What's wrong with the DSM? It is self-referring, it is self-validating. It is part of an ideological circle in which causality is attributed to doctors' perceptions of things as if they have an independent existence such that they can cause symptoms. Let me put this another way. What these disorders do is decontextualize people's responses to the world, thereby depriving them of comprehensibility then recontextualizing them in terms of the strange concept of mental illness, which is now positioned as causal. In the process, they invisibilize what is really going on so that no one can really be of help to the person in distress. I want to demonstrate this with a historical DSM diagnosis, selective mutism. 
It was a diagnosis given to people opting not to talk in certain situations. It's called a symptom, but let me suggest it's not. Deciding not to talk is not a symptom, it's a choice. Now, if I were a non-psychiatrist, that is, a normal person trying to get a sense of why a person is not talking, I would try to figure out what situ situations they weren't talking in. See if there was a common denominator that would explain what they're doing. You know, as is, is, is it safe to speak? Is this a person of color, for instance, that goes silent whenever they think they're seeing a racist present? Not a bad choice. Uh, is this a childhood sexual abuse survivor who is being triggered? Whatever it is, I would have to ask those questions, but that is not what the DSM prompts. According to the DSM, uh, selective mutism is the discreetest disease. So according to psychiatry, what causes the symptoms of not speaking? Well, selective mutism does. So you note the circularity. That's what all mental disorders are like. No explanatory value whatsoever. Yet they have the authority of law and they authorize what happens to people. Now I can imagine people objecting at this point, saying, but surely there are illnesses. Research shows this. But the point is it does not, and I want to now hone in on the term research because uh, uh, the word research doesn't prove anything. It's, it's a word. Let's, let's try to take apart this word a bit. Uh, one, uh, claims are made that research proves things when there, are, when there is no research <laughs> and no research that proved anything. That, that becomes a real problem. And uh, claims do not constitute proof. Uh, Hitler had said when he wrote Mein Kampf, if you repeat something 20, 30 times, everyone believes it. I think psychiatry shows that's true, but that doesn't make the claims correct. Uh, the the, um, the other problem is that research can be manipulated, so it can be made to look like it proves something when it proves absolutely nothing at all. So let's take a deep breath on this because research is like the holy grail and we want to believe it's objective and it's accurate. But let me tell you that in all sorts of areas, research is nothing but an industry. And in the case of the psychiatric industry, uh, it is trying to produce a product, a product of value to the psychiatrist and to the pharmaceutical agencies. It is funded by people and institutions with best interests. Their findings are themselves artificial products and a form of advertising. Oh yes, this is true, research proves it. Form of advertising. The truth is, the research is designed and the research is interpreted to come up with findings that the industry wants. Uh, I'll give you some examples of this. The enormous harm of treatments play out over time but the industry does not show, and the research does not show that harm over time. Why? Because all of the trials, and they say these are vintage trials, the, this, is, this is credible evidence, are all six weeks long, six to eight weeks long. Why six to eight weeks? Because that's long before you can get any hard evidence that, that damage has been caused. And so all, none of them come up with, with, with long-term damage because there isn't anything long-term and nothing's materialized yet. So research can now claim little or no adverse effect. Again, a manipulated product, a manipulated finding. More general problem, all research are in the hands of the drug companies for pharmaceuticals or, or the shock companies, depending on whose research it is, for they fund this research and they interpret this research. It's controlled by them at every stage of the process. They pay the people to do the research. They interpret it in their offices. You think these are interpreted by good researchers? These are interpreted by drunk company officials. Uh, and, and, then, and then they write the blurb for the, for the, for the product. And, and the FDA or Health Canada then accepts the blurb and then, it goes to the, and then it goes to the agents. That's what we're looking here. That's not called research, that's called manipulation. And so let me give you other examples of how this happens. Let's say, let's say there's 40 studies in various places to show a drug is more effective than, than placebo. And let's say of the 40, 35 show the opposite. Now all you have to do is present the five studies to Health and Welfare Canada or the FDA and presto, you've just shown something that shows it's more effective than placebo. In the meantime, they've buried way more studies that show it isn't effective. That is how the, 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 the studies work. Uh, some of my colleagues in, De in Denmark call it the medical mafia. I, I don't use those terms, but you can see why they do. This is fraudulent research. Beyond this, there's an equivocation of effectiveness. It's not determined by, by the people who are being treated, but by the healthcare professionals who are primed to interpret diminished affect and controllability as effectiveness. 
These routine practices in the manufacture of, uh, these are routine practices in the manufacture of psychiatric, quote, knowledge, unquote. Beyond this, there's even more directly manipulated results. This has been discovered by court cases. We, we, some companies hide what they do, but every so often someone takes them to court, and then we discover the most incredible things because things are, created, are found in discovery. So what have we found? Uh, once uh, expert witnesses get access to the files that are buried away in the drug company's offices that no one's ever seen, uh, we, that we, we find more and more examples of blatant manipulation. We find places where placebo outperformed the drugs. And so what they did is they told the people conducting the study, please, please take the following 15 people from the placebo group out, and then we will have better results. Then they're taken out, and then they claim it outperforms placebo. That's the kind of thing we found routinely, routinely, not, not once in a while. So another manipulation that is common to practice is the hiding of really bad results. What are example example of result bad results are they're hidden that depression that antidepressants cause depression and suicide totally hidden for years and years and years. Concrete example: Eli Lilly purposely held hid suicide ideation that serviced in drug group tests when testing lead their lead antidepressants. How did we discover this again through freedom of information complaint? Uh, uh, likewise, interestingly enough. Uh, a buried memo from an employee was discovered, and I want to read you. His name was Claude Bouchy, uh, and he objected to the fact that he was obliged to miscategorize su su the suicidality found in the drug group. Not in the placebo group, no, the drug group. And what did he say? This distraught employee, and uh, 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 this is in Germany, quote, I do not know that I could explain to the BGA that's uh, the German regulatory agency, a judge, a reporter, or even my own family, why we should do this, especially on the sensitive issue of suicide and suicidality. So their own employees were shocked by what they're doing. They did it on a less, and this was buried. So what do we have with psychiatry? Things called medical when they're not medical. People are called treated as dangerous when they're not dangerous. People ripped from their lives and deprived of any kind of meaningful help. Uh, all to serve uh, the, the, the invisibilization of what, uh, what is going on in people's lives, all to serve the coffers of the industry. Uh, again, uh, the, so uh, well, now when I get to this point, people say, well, maybe Bonnie, maybe that's true, but what about chemical imbalances? Surely there are chemical imbalances, and don't psychiatric drugs address those imbalances? So I, I'd like to hone in on that. Again, this is an invention created by the drug companies with the help of psychiatry. The horrific truth is not a single chemical imbalance has been established from a, for a single so-called mental illness. Rather, there's been a huge uh, propaganda campaign and a highly successful one at that. If we can say what the drug companies do well, they do propaganda well, really well. What is also a result of this is that uh, they end up manipulating the chemistry of a perfectly normal brain and turning it in the process into an abnormal brain, a brain that is permanently at war with itself. With itself. And they then create what is often, quote, clients, unquote, for life. So not only is psychiatry foundationless, it causes permanent bodily harm in the process of its so-called treatments. To be clear, I'm not saying that people don't temporarily sometimes feel better at a huge price. Take ECT, well, it's the exception because most people feel really awful right away. There's the odd person who initially gets a high on ECT. Why? Because when brain cells die, there's a release of endorphins. Guess what? You can get the same release of endorphins from running, and running does not cause brain damage. Now, you might say, and you might ask, but don't, people, but don't drugs help people navigate life better? Now, this is a hard concept, so I want to spend some, a little bit, just a bit of time on it. Uh, there was a really, because a lot of people feel it does, and a lot of people feel it helps their family members, and I totally get that, and I totally get why people are, are uh, you know, pursue this. There's a very interesting longitudinal study, almost non-existent in psychiatry, by, by, by a person called Harrow. 30-year study 
on the people that everyone seemed to agree really are psychotic and that schizophrenics, how they fare on antipsychotics compared to schizophrenics, not on antipsychotics. So there are three findings here and these findings are terribly important and they explain a lot. The first finding is in the first five years, people called schizophrenics fare somewhat better on the drugs than not on the drugs. Why? Because the drugs impede feeling that might be getting in your way. They impede thinking that might get in your way. Uh, and they level things out. The same reason if you smoke grass, you might feel better. The same reason you might take any drug, you might feel better. OK. OK, that's the first, three, th th first five years. What happens in the next five years? In the next five years, the people who go off the drugs feel better, than, fare better, and do better in life than the people who stay on. Now you might say, okay, there's an answer here. People should go on the drugs for five years and then go off. And that looks like the obvious answer until we come to the third finding. What was found after 20 years? And here's the kicker. Uh, the, uh, the, the people, uh, uh, who fares best of all? So it's not the people who, uh, who stayed on the drugs. It is not the people who went off the drugs after five years. It is the people who never went on the drugs in the, in the first place, ever at any point. They fared the best as all. So the answer is they should never have been on the drugs in the first place. And I'd ask people to keep that in mind when you see people who seem to be doing better. The, there will be an expense down the road. That is the expense. Why? Because the drugs brain damage people. All of the psychiatric drugs brain damage people. All of the psychiatric treatments brain damage people, where it will be lobotomy drugs or ECT. And indeed, there is what's a one-to-one -one correlation between what's called the therapeutic effects and the brain damage. I'd like to return now to where the speech began, the school shootings. Many people follow what I'm saying but come to an abrupt halt when they start thinking of the various school shootings that have been happening throughout North America over the last few decades. Not necessarily the Montreal Massacre, but Columbine, and there's been oodles of them every year for a while. We had three or four school shootings. They were massive and they kept going on. And, and, the, answer, and the answer at every level of government, right up to... Uh, uh, right up to uh, presidents and the wives of presidents of the United States was that if only these people were on a therapeutic dosage of psychiatric drugs, uh, this wouldn't have happened. If only. And so let's round up all the kids and put them on psychiatric drugs and, and, and no less of authority than Hillary Clinton said that. We have to round up the kids and test them and treat them whether they like it or not. Uh, that's a quote. What's the truth of the thing? The vast majority of the school shooters in North America were on a therapeutic dose of psychiatric drugs at the time of the shooting. The vast majority. So again, uh, and so what is their answer now? Put them all on psychiatric drugs. In fact, there's lots of things that cause the school shootings. There's alienation, there's sexism, there's racism, there's all sorts of things. But one thing is without doubt, the, the drugs cause excitation, mania, and violence. And that's, it, it is one of the causal factors, a huge causal factor of the school shootings. And what's being prescribed by the government is uh, exactly giving more of what causes the problem in the first place. This is not something we can afford. That said, I want to, you know, uh, I want to give some thick, quick myths and facts about, uh, about uh, psychiatry. Uh, myth, there is proof of mental illness. Fact, there is no proof of a single mental illness. Myth, psychiatry is scientific and rigorous fact psychiatry is a pretense of science and a pretense of rigor. Myth, psychiatric drugs address chemical imbalances. Fact, psychiatric drugs create chemical imbalances. Uh, myth, people called mentally ill are dangerous to self or other and so need to be restrained. Fact, they're no more and in fact slightly less dangerous than everyone else. Myth, psychiatry serves the common good. Fact. Psychiatry serves the psychiatric industry. So these were among the findings of my research. 
And here are some of my recommendations. Insofar as psychiatric substances like psychiatric medications are not medical, and beyond this are inherently harmful, in long, in the, you know, people called doctors in the long run shouldn't be allowed to prescribe them. People called doctors should be prescribing things called med their medicine, not things that are not medicine and actually cause harm. To be clear, I'm not talking about banning them any more than I would ban grass or heroin or anything else. I'm just saying they're not medical substances and should not be prescribed by doctors. Given psychiatry is not real medicine but bogus medicine, indeed harmful, it should be not be recognized as a legitimate branch of doctors, a legit, sorry, legitimate branch of medicine. Now, I think a lot of doctors suspect this. No one is willing to say anything because, you know, there's there's a there's a union there's you know there's 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 cohesion within the medical profession where people can't. But we can see that they don't quite believe this. Uh, in recent years, they've done surveys on which areas of medicine. Uh, our people are most likely to go into and in which they stay away from the least popular with psychiatry because they know this isn't medical. On some profound level, people know it. They just won't say it. Um, what they're claiming instead is, is there are the victims of, of discrimination. They're not the victims of discrimination. People are saying there's something wrong with this area. Another recommendation, that the relationship with the state and psychiatry should be severed. Without the state, psychiatry has almost no power. The powers are given by the state. Uh, uh, the, uh, more generally, uh, the state in itself, whatever it does, should not be promoting or allowing people who have committed no crime and are presenting no problem to people to be deprived of freedom. And I'm not the only one saying this. And anti-psychiatry people are not the only ones saying, let me say that the United Nations is saying this. The United Nations, in, the, in, in its own interpretation of the Conventions of the Rights of Persons with Disability, have said there should be no forced psychiatric treatment, there should be no forced psychiatric incarceration. And in interpreting what it means by, by commenting to judges, they said that judges, if it takes before them, should order the institutions throughout the world to open their doors and take the bars off so the people can leave, take the locks off. No one has, but let's take a look at this. No less prestigious an organization than the United Nations is saying this is a profound and unacceptable violation of human rights. Now the things I've just recommended, obviously they add up to some kind of gradual abolition of psychiatry. For psychiatry cannot survive without these powers and without being propped up by the state. Which brings me to the question of reform. Most people who are critical of psychiatry are in favor of reforming psychiatry, not getting rid of psychiatry. Partially this direction uh, c comes from a, a, an inherent way of thinking that we have as human beings, that reform is inherently a more reasonable position. It feels not so extreme, and we have a bias toward moderation, toward what Aristotle would call the golden mean, toward what Aboriginal community might call balance. Every civilization has a bias toward moderation. And let me suggest, I'm not complaining about this default mode. It essentially serves us well most of the time. Most of the time, moderation is best. The question is, is it all best in all situations? And my answer is no. When isn't, when, when, when two things are true, both the fundamental tenets of the practice is mistaken, that's one, and two, it's inherently harmful. That's what we have here with psychiatry. And, and are there other instances out there that's out throughout the world? Of course there are. Uh, when, when the issue of slavery came up in North America and there was an issue of what to do, there were abolitionists. They would be similar to my position on psychiatry. Uh, and then, uh, then there were abolitionists who called for slavery abolition. And then there were actually, believe it or not, people who called for reform. If we only had the masters kinder, if they only didn't whip so often, if they only didn't look pretty silly today. These, these, but that was the position, and that would look like the reasonable position, which is why the reformers always look more reasonable than the radicals, but that doesn't make them right. It isn't, wasn't right with slavery, and it isn't right with psychiatry. That said, what is the situation, the situation we're in today? Despite the standard claim by psychiatry to ever greater progress, there has never been so much psychiatric intrusion, uh, been so invasive, invasive and extensive 
with the degree of da damage so astronomical as we have today. We also have a huge spread of psychiatry to new constituencies. Once upon a time, they barely looked at children. Now, children are a huge target. Once upon a time, it was restricted to, to, to North America and Europe and their colonies. Now, we're marketing it to the whole world. Uh, to underdeveloped, so-called underdeveloped nations, we're marketing our mental health solutions and making our financial loans through the World Bank, et cetera, conditional on acceptance of our mental health template. Uh, the, uh, this is frightening, and basically, this is the this is the, the this is the white world uh, uh, um, sending it and 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 and. and uh, enforcing this upon uh, the, the world of color, uh, the North forcing this upon the South. And the other thing we're doing is we're creating a virtual epidemic of the atrogenic illness. Atrogenic means caused by doctors. Uh, the, uh, and we are, you know, and we are putting in the process successive generations at risk. Because let's be clear, the biggest group at risk right now is children, and, it, and this looks like it's continuing. So we need something far more extensive than reform. We, uh, and we need something even far more extensive than getting rid of psychiatry, though it's a damn good beginning. Uh, I want to share some of what I think we need to do. On a very basic level, if people are as, a are as alienated and confused as findings suggest they are today, this is not an issue of mental illness, but rather an ind indication that something is wrong with our society. Let's begin then by changing societies, and rather than saying it's all individual, let's give them drugs. Uh, the society I'm suggesting we need to build would be based on environmentalism, envi egalitarianism, participated decision making, uh, an end to systemic oppressions like racism, or as far as we can get an end to them, as racism and sexism, a rebuilding of connections, mutual caring and compassion. Some basic guidelines here. Our means are as important as our ends. Everyone has rights, including the right to choose ways of being that worry others. No one is, is, is dispensable or expendable. Commodification, reification, disciplines, financialization, institutionalization, and professionalization constitute traps. Everyone should be an integral part of decision making. Uh, the, uh, so, so community decision making rather than representative government. We should protect the commons, including the air we breathe. Sexism, racism, classism need to be guarded against. Compassion, empathy, and acceptance. Accepting of difference rather than deciding what's normal and isn't normal should be what is seen as our cardinal virtues. Leadership should be shared. Significantly, all important life's parts of life, like child rearing, should be seen as everyone's job. All should mother and father, and in line with aboriginal values, children should not be interfered with except when intruding on the rights of others, but rather nurtured and allowed to develop in their own way. Schools should not be the imprisonment they are now. They should be experiential, nurturing, with a commodity placed on creativity and skills for community learning. Examples of learning that should be emphasized are conflict resolution, peacemaking, surviving in the wilderness, thinking outside the box. Just to give you a sense of the magnitude of the difference, in such classrooms, children would not be diagnosed ADHD for, day, for, for daydreaming, but rather dreaming would be welcomed as a sign of creativity from which individual and community, from which both the individuals and the community as a whole benefits. So a dreaming, in fact, would be celebrated rather than penalized, rather than criminalized, rather than pathologized. Even, we go for, even before we go any further, you can see the benefits in a, uh, to the, to the so-called mad or troubled in such a society. If we live in a more holistic, pluralistic, and accepting way, people are less likely to be beset by problems, and what, what, what relates to this, more like, less likely to be seen as being or having a problem. This is a natural consequence. The content of the education could, indeed, could in turn bolster this. In addition to what is already outlined, part of everyone's education could be studying the contribution of people deemed mad, also co-investigating myths which inherently problematize such concepts as madness. Let me give you an example because I think it's one you'll all know, the example of Cassandra. This is the fall of Troy in case everyone, people weren't sure of that term. Uh, Cassandra was, uh, was, uh, was the princess of Troy. And she was blessed with a gift and a curse. 
And the gift was, that was the gift of prophecy, what she foretold was to always be true, and the curse was no one would ever believe her. You can imagine how crazy making that is. Okay, so what did she do? She, the, she foretold the fall of Troy, and of course no one believed her. And so she got more and more upset and she ran through the streets, her hair flying in all directions saying, do something, do something, Troy is going to fall to the Greeks. So of course, this was a clear sign of abnormality and madness and they locked her in a citadel, uh, which is the precursor, say, of the modern mental hospital, where no one would have to endure her lunatic rants. Well, what was the consequence? We all know the story of the Trojan horse, the people, the Greeks hiding in the Trojan horse, coming up, weaponized Greeks, and, and, and coming up and conquering Troy, and Troy didn't fall. From such myths, students from the earliest years would come to appreciate that people who see things differently are not to be shunned, are not a danger to be controlled, but are indeed gifted people from whom others can learn. Moreover, and you can see it in this story anyway, a warning sign of danger. Nor is this remotely as, far, as much as we can do. People from their earliest years should be taught what I've coined as a word, mad literacy. This is a conception of mine which I'm suggesting is uh, coming from the fact that people overwhelmingly take people who they don't understand and interpret them as speaking gibberish. And what I'm saying is the problem is not the person speaking, it's lack of mad literacy on our part. We don't know how to understand people who process things in different ways the majority do, and so we dismiss them. Uh, I want to go back to, what did I call her again? Amy. All right. Let's go back to Amy. People interpreted her as dangerous because they didn't understand what she was doing. Why would she step off, strip off her clothes in the middle of the night? Well, let me tell you what she was doing. Uh, this would happen whenever she read something horrible, well, not whenever, but at bad times, when she would read something horrible in the newspaper, such as a war is spreading. So she would see a war spreading, she would, peep, she would see that more and more people were being, were being uh, assaulted, were being killed, and so on, and she saw something horrible, and she was right that she was seeing something horrible. And this is what civilization was producing. So what she would do, it was a symbolic solution. She would strip off her clothes, because clothes are the trapping of civilization. So it was a way of getting distance from this thing that she knew was wrong. Because she was sensitive to what was wrong. She didn't want to identify with it. She had what we might call a fine sensibility. If we had nourished such sensibilities, we could pick up on the dynamic and understand what to do, as, so, as opposed to call the police and have her uh, handcuffed uh, and dragged to a mental institution. Even before you think of services, you can see see that how people now deem mad, or indeed anyone in stress, and in fact all of us, because we're all sometimes in stress, would be in a better position. That, get, that said, to get down to services per se, in line with the value placed on pluralism and choice, there would be a plurality of services and a better society we could build with people able to choose what worked for them, whether it be yoga, music therapy, or a place to scream or cry and be held. And let's be clear that plurality is needed and choice is absolutely essential. No choice, no meaningful treatment. Uh, they d not a possibility without the other. If you, if you can't, if you don't have a plurality, you don't have choice, and if you don't have choice, you have, you have violence. Uh, people could be, uh, people from the earliest years could be schooled in general helping skills so that everyone could take a turn being a befriender. Notice I use the word befriender, not therapist. We got that language from medicine. We should get rid of it. I say as a known therapist of the city. Okay, also at being a mediator for conflict, because a lot of the things that are called personal and only personal are interpersonal conflicts. And if we had a way of resolving interpersonal conflicts, rather than either hauling people to jail or hauling people to a psychiatric institution, which are, seem to be our two main methods, uh, we, could, we could solve a lot of stuff and we could have a more cohesive society. Such services should not be professionalized but, uh, or, or set apart, but built into the very fabric of life. For example, every apartment building could have someone to, on call to deal with the stress that might happen in the middle of the night, say with whoever's on call rotating so that we all shared it. And that includes an act of aggression, because let's be clear, we're, we're, we're a species given to violence. We can, we, we can be aggressive, but, but we can also learn how to neutralize uh, violence instead of, instead of freaking out at it and punishing everybody in the process. Uh, 
if there is a question of aggression, we could call a community meeting. And the question could, uh, you know, facing this meeting would not be who is sick, who should be controlled, or who should be punished, but who needs what, and how do we build peace in the community. To see how some of this could concretely play out, let's go back uh, to, again, Amy. Yeah, I remember her name. Instead of calling the police, let's say we had such a community, and we had people on call in the middle of the night. Whoever's door she knocked on can invite her in, could offer her tea, could listen to what she's saying, could invalidate her, could ask, what is it that's emergency? You know, that's an easy question to ask. Can you tell me about the emergency? Wouldn't take long to figure out, oh, you're upset about the war. My God, I'm kind of upset about that, too. That sounds very different than handcuffs. Uh, then if more assistance is needed, they could call in an on-call person and come and sit uh, with her longer and explore whatever needs to be explored. As you can see, this constitutes a deprofessionalization and commoning of service, a return to real community. Am I saying there's no room for professionals whatsoever? Not quite. But what, what we don't need is what they always call for, more and more professionals. We need less professionals. We need more and more real people helping each other. Uh, the, so what do we need to do now? Uh, lots of things. Uh, we could use more knowledge about how psychiatry works, and uh, people can ask me about it later, but we just have had happen at U of T an unheard of thing, a scholarship in anti-psychiatry that's materializing, and, and people can donate to that because it's a matching scholarship. Uh, we, need, uh, we need more research, and, uh, we, and, and uh, the not, not the bogus research, good research. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we had mentioned at the beginning, I, I, I and a whole bunch of people here have a book coming out shortly that, that, that nine different teams created, nine different teams did research into some area of the institution known as psychiatry to come up with original knowledge. The book is called Psychiatry Inter in, in, Interrogated, an Institutional Ethnography Anthology. And the book launch will be February the 24th at OISE. And could people, there's a number of people who are part of it. Could you guys stand up and effort you're already standing? Could you stand up if you could, if you're a part of this? OK. Uh, there's actually, yes, great. OK. Thanks, Rebecca. OK. We could. Uh, we could, and we'll distribute information on that if you want to come to the book launch, because you'll hear a bunch more speeches by people more articulate than me. OK, we could start pressuring for change. We could start making change ourselves, because if all we do is ask the state, well, guess what? The state is not about to abolish psychiatry. But if we start creating different solutions itself, you never know what can happen. The uh, talk to family members and see what we can create all right now. If you're living in an apartment building, talk to other people in the apartment building. What can we do? Could we could we rotate so we all have so there's always someone we can go to? Could we do this ourselves and not call in professionals and not call in the police? The uh, maybe we can create niches all over the place by which we are having genuine community, in which we are genuinely befriending other people and each other. And I also want to say, in all of this, let's not forget the children. The children are the big group under attack right now. We have to protect our youth, and we have to get together and figure out how to protect our youth. I want to end this speech today. Oh, don't forget, I will. Don't worry, I really will end. Uh, with a, uh, with a, um, with the, uh, uh, the, a quote from the end of the book. I started with a quote from the beginning of the book. And it's, uh, the quote is about a, uh, uh, it mentions a young man called Kevin. And if you want to know who Kevin is, he's a young man who killed himself, who had, uh, after about 10 years on psychiatric drugs, do not forget, drugs do not stop suicide, they lead to suicide. And they, he killed himself because of the terrible state the drugs left him in. So I think you can understand the quote except for that. Okay, here's the quote. As individuals and communities, the overriding question staring us in the face is this. Are we going to sit by as our planet continues to be ravished? As our connection with one another is progressively eroded? As our birthright, the commons, disappears? as society moves closer and closer to Farmageddon, 
as our children are placed under a microscope and labeled ADHD, as people like Kevin throw up their hands in despair and kill themselves. The job which lies before us is the time-honored task of altering the world, in essence, of standing up for life. Despite appearances, the state will not help us here. Neither will industry, for it runs counter to their mess interests. With the well-being of our planet, our society, our loved ones, ourselves in the balance, the onus is on us. Truth be told, it always was. Thank you very much, your great audience. Please don't clap. <laughs> okay.